Choosing a VR headset can be a minefield if you're not familiar with all the specs and terminology associated with them. Resolution, field of view, Fresnel lenses, aspheric lenses, pancake lenses, OLED displays, micro OLED displays, refresh rates and IPD adjustments. The list goes on. So in this video, I want to dive into each of the common attributes mentioned on VR headset spec sheets and explain how they can affect a user's overall VR experience. So let's take a look. Immersed Robot Resolution is one of the first things mentioned on a manufacturer's spec sheet, and it's usually split down into two numbers, a horizontal and a vertical pixel count, sometimes shown on a spec sheet as a per eye figure, sometimes shown as a total resolution of the entire display for both eyes. The higher the number, the higher the resolution, and therefore the greater the sharpness and clarity within VR. When the first modern consumer VR headsets were released back in 2016 with the HTC Vive and the Rift CV1, resolution was relatively low, but the standard has been steadily increasing over time. Generally, higher numbers are almost always better when talking about resolution in VR. Some people will mention diminishing returns and the fact that PC hardware can struggle at those high resolutions, rendering it somewhat useless after a certain point. However, there are options available, such as undersampling or subsampling to maintain clarity and reduce screen door effect. Screen door effect is something that is rapidly becoming a non-issue in the latest VR headsets. It's a name for certain visual effects created by the gaps between pixels. In the original HTC Vive and Rift, these gaps were noticeable between the pixels, and you could definitely see this visual effect when you were in experiences in VR. But headsets are rapidly moving towards completely eliminating this issue by reducing the gaps and having a cleaner image. So by having a higher resolution headset, even if the PC hardware is incapable of running at that native higher resolution, then subsampling is still a benefit by rendering at a lower resolution on the PC, yet still gaining benefit of a lower screen door effect when it's sent to the headset. Beyond this, there is another rendering trick related to resolution which can help with clarity. This is called super sampling, and this is rendering at a higher resolution than the native resolution of the headset in order to increase sharpness. It works as an effective form of anti-aliasing, although it's very inefficient and demanding on hardware, so you will notice a reduction in performance if you super sample too much. It almost seems counterintuitive to render on your PC at a higher resolution than that of the native resolution of the headset. Headset, and yet in practice it creates a noticeable increase in sharpness and clarity within VR, so it's definitely something to consider if you have a suitably powerful graphics card in your PC. Overall, resolution is an extremely important factor when deciding on a VR headset, with higher resolutions generally being preferable, even if your PC hardware might struggle to render at those native resolutions. Diminishing returns after a certain point are a real thing, but we still probably haven't reached a threshold where resolution isn't a huge factor for improving the experience in VR. There are a number of display types used in VR headsets, but I'll be focusing on the three most commonly mentioned. Display technology is changing so rapidly that innovations are constantly being made in this area, with categories and subcategories appearing in each. But to keep things simple, I'll focus on today's technology that is currently being used in consumer headsets. All these displays feature low persistence, which means they shouldn't blur or smear pixels from rapid head movements. Low persistence is a technology which flashes pixels on and off rapidly on a display rather than keeping them permanently illuminated in order to prevent this ghosting or smearing effect. So first up we have OLED displays and these are displays which have very good colour balance with good black levels due to the lack of a need of a backlight and they usually but not always appear in a pentile pixel arrangement which can give perceived low resolution and higher screen door effects than some other types of displays although this is less significant an issue at higher resolutions. OLED panels were used in the first wave of consumer VR headsets, modern day consumer VR headsets such as the PSVR, HTC Vive and Rift CV1, but for a time they seem to be abandoned in newer VR headsets in favour of the higher perceived resolution of LCD panels, which I'll get to in just a moment. However, OLEDs are starting to make a return in some upcoming headsets, notably the recently announced PSVR 2 among other VR headsets. Next up is LCD, and these are really the other dominant type of display in today's headsets. 
LCDs usually don't have quite so good black levels and this is because they do feature a backlight but rather than pentile pixel arrangement these are usually arranged with a RGB stripe display pattern which uses three subpixels per pixel to give a perceived higher resolution for a like for like pentile display. And on a side note actually, the original PSVR did feature an OLED display which wasn't in the pentile subpixel arrangement but rather in the RGB stripe pattern to give the benefits of OLED with the higher subpixel count of LCDs. And LCDs generally have slightly less motion blur due to a lower persistence but again this is becoming less of an issue with modern displays. And the types of headsets which used a LCD panel are the Oculus Quest 2, the Valve Index and Reverb. G2 just to give a few examples. And finally we have the OLED micro displays and these are a newer type of technology which are starting to appear in some VR headsets. OLED micro displays are rumoured to be in the still unannounced upcoming Apple VR AR headset but they're also in the Apara 5K and the newly announced Shiftall Megain X headset. And these are usually very small displays with very high resolutions for their size which means that they have a very high level of pixel density. They are usually paired with pancake lenses in VR headsets and I'll get to pancake lenses in another section of this video. OLED micro displays usually suffer from poor brightness levels due to increasing the brightness on these displays causes persistence issues and motion blurring artifacts but the technology is rapidly progressing to remove these problems and the end goal of using OLED micro displays in VR headsets is that they will be able to deliver much smaller form factor headsets in the long run. The refresh rate of a display is the number of times the screen refreshes per second and a common refresh rate for VR originally was 90Hz and it's still probably the primary one that manufacturers will use as a base level refresh rate although this is changing a little bit now. Now the higher the refresh rate the smoother the experience and generally the higher the refresh rate the better as long as the hardware that you're running your VR headset on can keep up. Now ideally you want to match the frame rate of any given game or experience in VR to the native refresh rate of the VR headset you're playing it on and when this isn't possible then multiples of this refresh rate can be used by VR software to keep the experience relatively smooth. I made a video about frame rates, refresh rates and reprojection which has more information on this. This should be linked in the top corner of this video now so you can take a look at that for a little bit more information on refresh rates and how it plays into the frame rate of the experience that you're playing. But some headsets have fixed refresh rates such as the Rift S it's locked at 80 Hz, the Reverb G2 is locked at 90 Hz for example, but other VR headsets have switchable refresh rates. The Valve Index can range from 80 Hz all the way up to 144 Hz. The Quest 2 likewise can range from 72 Hz up to 120 Hz. So it's good to have these options, especially if you are trying to match the performance level of your hardware to a refresh rate in your VR headset in order to give a native frame rate to refresh rate experience which is really the ideal way to play a game. The field of view refers to the amount of your natural vision available to you in any given VR headset. Generally the field of view in VR headsets ranges from 90 degrees to 110 degrees horizontal but some headsets such as the Pimax have very wide field of views. Usually the higher the field of view the better and more immersive the experience although there can be some unwanted artifacts such as distortion and lower pixel density when running headsets at wide field of views. Also on this point the numbers on spec sheets can be a little bit deceiving. The field of view is split into two figures horizontal field of view and vertical field of view. Sometimes spec sheets will only show the horizontal field of view figure or even a figure which refers to the diagonal field of view. It can sometimes be difficult to determine which on spec sheets. The other aspect of this is that field of view is very subjective from person to person due to differences in face shapes and eye position. To get the maximum field of view available to you in any given VR headset your eyes really need to be as close to the lenses as possible. But factors such as a prominent brow, recessed eye pockets etc can vary and this is why there can be a lot of disagreement regarding field of view on forums and this is another reason why trying a VR headset before purchasing is always preferable. The 
lenses in a VR headset are used to focus your eyes on a display which is only a couple of centimeters away. There are three main types of lenses spoken about at the moment in VR, but there is a lot of progress being made on this technology. So things change all the time and there is no perfect optical system at this moment in time. Everything seems to be about making compromises in different areas. So the first and most common lens type used in VR headsets at the moment is called the Fresnel lens. And the reason the manufacturers originally went for the Fresnel lens and still continue to do so in some cases is because these lenses can be made thinner and lighter than some others. They also have the advantage of minimizing dynamic distortions as well, although they can sometimes suffer from a small sweet spot. And the sweet spot just refers to the very clear area in the very center of the lens. The other disadvantage of Fresnel lenses is that they can suffer from god rays and glare as well. These can both be issues in these types of lenses, especially in some Fresnel lenses where they have visible concentric rings around the lens which can make god rays and glare even more of a problem in some cases. Another type of lens being used in VR headsets at the moment is the aspheric lens and this was used in the original PSVR and it's also being used in the upcoming Vario Aero headset as well. And the advantage of aspheric lenses is that they have a very large sweet spot with sometimes they can even get edge to edge clarity as well which means that all the area that you look around within the VR headset is clear. There is no degradation or blurring towards the edges of the lens as you look there. They also have minimal glare issues usually but they do suffer from being slightly heavier than Fresnel lenses and they can be prone to some distortion issues especially pupil swim and I've also made a video on some features of VR headsets which don't get mentioned on spec sheets pupil swim being one of them so you can check that out as well for a little bit more information on distortion and pupil swim. Pancake lenses have been around for a while but they are being referred to far more recently due to the fact that they are closely associated with OLED micro displays and these are being used in some upcoming VR headsets due to breakthroughs in the lens technology of pancake lenses. They consist of multiple elements in order to make up the lens and this allows the lenses to be placed much closer to the displays which is why they work so well with the OLED micro displays. Again coupling them with the small micro displays means that this could move towards smaller form factor VR headsets such as the recently announced Shiftall Megane X headset again. The issues of pancake lenses really revolve around optical efficiency in that they block out quite a lot of light and this can result in brightness issues in the headsets. And there is another type of lens which is only featured in one VR headset so far to the best of my knowledge and that's the Lynx R1. And once again I've got a detailed video on my channel regarding this headset so you can find that there. But this features a lens of a very strange shape and it's called a fourfold catadioptic freeform prison lens. And I didn't have to look that up especially for this video I promise. But the strange shape of this lens basically splits the image into four quadrants but the lens can be placed directly onto the display so again it's sort of featured in these headsets which have a small form factor and it's ideally suited to a headset like the Lynx R1. Now the sweet spot in this headset it makes it look like the sweet spot is quite small but when I use the Lynx R1 I can say that it wasn't actually too bad but of course your eye does have to be relatively central in order for the image to be received correctly in your eye and give a true VR image. But this is an interesting one just to finish up on anyway. And just quickly while I'm talking about lenses, I do want to mention IPD adjustment here. So IPD is the interpupillary distance, the distance between a user's eyes. IPD adjustment is used to ensure a clear focused image for all users, independent of how far or close together their eyes are. And IPD adjustments in terms of VR headsets usually comes in two forms, software and hardware adjustments. So software allows the image to be moved on the display to align with the user's eyes and it can create a problem of being off center with the lenses due to them not moving. Something like the PSVR, the original PSVR used this. 
hardware IPD adjustment allows you to manually or automatically move the lenses and individual displays to match your eye separation much better. So the Valve Index, Vive, Rift CV1, these headsets all had a hardware IPD adjustment. The Rift S doesn't have a hardware IPD adjustment and the Quest 2 sort of compromises. It has three set positions for IPD, a small, medium and large and so this again isn't ideal but at least it's something in the way towards a movable IPD adjustment in terms of hardware. Tracking systems allow users to look and move around in VR experiences. The user's movements are monitored by various processes and inform what should be rendered in the display of their VR headset at any one time to match their movements and position. The earlier and simpler forms of tracking were based around 3 degrees of freedom or 3 doff movement. This allowed for simple rotational head movement to look around the virtual world. Now, 6 degrees of freedom are the norm, allowing for both rotational movement of your head and positional movement allowing you to walk freely around a space. The two general forms of tracking are inside-out tracking and outside-in tracking, and these can be further broken down in some ways, but uh, I'll keep things simple just for the purposes of this video. The original Rift, CV1 and PlayStation VR used outside-in tracking. This means that they used external cameras to track the position of the headset and controllers. The more cameras you have, the better and more accurate the tracking in this kind of scenario. More cameras also help to lower controller occlusion issues. Occlusion in this context refers to when your controllers are blocked from the view of the cameras by your body or other objects. Steam VR headsets such as the Valve Index and HTC Vive use inside-out tracking via a specific marker. It uses two or more external laser-emitting base stations. The timing and the position of the lasers is tracked by the headset to calculate its position. This kind of tracking is very accurate and it also has lower controller occlusion issues depending on the placement of the base stations. And finally, headsets such as the Rift S, the Windows Mixed Reality headsets such as the Reverb G2, Oculus Quest and the upcoming PlayStation VR 2 all use inside-out tracking without the need for a specific hardware marker. Sometimes this is referred to as markerless inside-out tracking. Cameras are placed on the headset to track architectural and object features in a room or play space to calculate relative position. The cameras also track the controllers which can cause some occlusion issues if the controllers are blocked or out of view of the cameras on the headset. The industry does seem to generally be moving in the direction of markerless inside-out tracking out of convenience, although Steam VR tracking is still probably generally regarded as the highest overall quality, even though it's much more expensive and less convenient due to the need of external hardware. Eye tracking is starting to appear in more and more VR headsets. The PlayStation VR 2 is now confirmed to also be featuring eye tracking. Integrated eye tracking can help with immersion and social experiences in VR, but it's also very useful for what's called dynamic foveated rendering in applications that support it. Dynamic foveated rendering reduces demand on rendering hardware since the resolution can be reduced on the periphery of a user's vision. This allows for very sharp images in the centre of the view where the user is looking at any one time, while reducing resolution on peripheral vision where fidelity is far less important. Eye tracking, although not common at the moment, is starting to be integrated in more and more VR headsets. For audio, there really isn't too much to say in terms of hardware. 3D audio or spatial audio is generally regarded as standard now, and this is what moves sound appropriately around in an experience as a user moves and turns their head. Many headsets have integrated headphones, but some don't. The off-ear headphones provided in the Valve Index and Reverb G2 are generally regarded as some of the best integrated audio solutions in VR headsets at this time. Some people do prefer to use their own wired headphones however, and most headsets now allow for a 3.5mm audio jack connection to provide this option. Audio is very subjective once again and it can vary from person to person as to what they consider suitable for VR. So those are the main specs I wanted to go through in this video. If there's anything I left out then please let me know in comments and if I get enough suggestions then I may very well make a part 2 to go along with this video on the subject. There are plenty of smaller, perhaps less important specs I've missed off, but I think I've hit most of the common ones listed on VR headset spec sheets. 
But anyway, that's pretty much it from me. Please subscribe if you'd like more videos like this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Please consider supporting Immerse Robot on Patreon or joining the Discord or following me on Twitter or better yet, all of the above. Links in the description below.